people, so I'm not sure everybody knows exactly what a historian does. I mean, I think people have heard the expression, you are what you eat, but for a society, a culture, a civilization, you're pretty much, you are what you've done. And it's up to historians to trace that lineage back for values and ideas and things, and also to put it into context. What I do specifically, the area of my, of my history endeavor, is the Hellenistic Age, which was brought on by one of the most transformational figures in history, Alexander the so-called Great. And I've, I've written a book about him, and I've written a book about his father, and I've written a book about uh, one of his successors. And so I might study that period, and uh, you know, there, I guess you could say, impact on what is today and following you know, where ideas and values come from. But it's interesting that at the war colleges, they're, they're still studying him. I mean, Alexander would be thrilled to death I mean, if he looked down or up from wherever he is. Well, the strange thing is I started off basically to be a historian of Rome. And when I went off to graduate school, the main person I wanted to work with had taken leave that particular time. He'd written me letters and everything else, but he hadn't mentioned he was going to be gone for a semester. And there was a new faculty member who had just uh, gotten his PhD in Oxford. And he was teaching a course on the Hellenistic age. I took it in part because there wasn't what I really wanted to take. I took some other courses and a lot of language courses in classical languages. And uh, I just loved it. That was sort of, you know, one of those moments you don't expect. You can learn a lot from the past. For instance, Thucydides, who was a historian who was writing in the fifth century BC, probably the best ancient historian there ever was. He describes a plague that affected Athens during the Peloponnesian War. He doesn't know about germs or anything like that, but he notices how the disease seems to advance through different populations. I mean, he doesn't understand the mechanism of transmission, but he knows it's being transmitted. And indeed, if you look at plague histories, uh, most of the things that are coming from the CDC uh, have been known for a very long period of time. If you have a bunch of people who are sick, for God's sake, don't hang out with them. Well, it's been said, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Uh, going back to Thucydides again, he said the real reason for history, in his view, is that while times may change and fashion may change, people don't. And so studying it over time gives you insights both into the very nature of humanity and also into the nature of the present and the future. And so we get, we get away from that a great deal. Uh, I've noticed uh, one of my great complaints right now about the university is we have moved pretty much away from foreign languages. We have two, and yet we have a world that you know, supposedly you know, be online with everyone anywhere instantaneously. And uh, the assumption seems to be that everyone in the world should learn English, which, by the way, is a kind of arrogance that existed amongst the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks divided the world into Greeks and barbarians. And that has made me think about, you know, this push for English as a national language. When you had such divisions in the Greek world that separated people, what were the things that tied them together? Well, Greek world religion was one. We don't have that. And if you have a society that doesn't have a long history of ethnic identity, which we do not, then what is it that ties us together? And it's, well, I used to think it was the Constitution of the United States. I now wonder how that's exactly tying us together after recent events. But language is one, and so I've had to kind of rethink when you see these laws coming forward about uh, making English the national language. Is the Greeks, like Americans, were typically monolingual. The Greek view was our language is the only one really worth knowing, and if you want to talk to us, you better learn it. And when I first started out to supplement my income, I led tours. And I remember uh, I was leading a tour in France, 
And a woman came up to me and said, what's wrong with these people who don't speak English? And that's kind of a strange question when you're in Paris. But <laughs> so it's, uh, we, we have kind of that sense. And it's one of the, I mean, I can think about a national language being one way of gaining some sense of national unity, but I also see the problems with that as well. And one group trying to impose their culture on another. But it, it's, it's interesting how in the Greek world that was one of the things like religion that tied them together, although not very well. They never united in antiquity. They were all busy fighting one another. <laughs>